Okay, I think most people are here by now, so I will start. So welcome everyone to my presentation. My name is Peter Scarf, and I am the creator of Workers for LabVIEW. I have a background in mechatronic engineering and computer science. I am a certified LabVIEW architect, and I have been developing with LabVIEW for approximately 12 years now. <clears throat> so to start off, this is my Our Giants, a female slide. So this is Professor Christina Shea, and Professor Shea is head of the Institute of Design and Materials and Fabrication at ETH in Zurich, which is the university that I work at. Since earning her doctorate at Carnegie Mellon uh, in the US in 97, she has worked in the UK, Germany, and Switzerland, and developed an expertise in computational design. Her work today is focused on using computational models and tools to design more innovative and complex engineered systems and products. This means, for example, the 3D printing of structures that were previously too difficult or too expensive to manufacture in another way, such as uh, spinal disc implants. So she's definitely a very valuable member of the university that I work at. Okay. So currently in the LabVIEW community today, the two most commonly used queued message handler based frameworks include DQMH, which is a what I call a classic LabVIEW based framework, meaning it is not object oriented and it is based on the LabVIEW queued message handler template. And then we have the active framework, which is a heavily object oriented based framework. And now I'm introducing another framework called Workers. And Workers is an object-oriented based framework that allows you to develop in the style of the classic LabVIEW Queued Message Handler template. And each of these frameworks can be used to develop multi-process applications in LabVIEW using the Queued Message Handler design pattern. In this presentation, uh, I'm going to introduce the main features of the Workers framework, the framework scripting tools and messaging API, and then show you how to create a small Workers application in a live demo. With that said, let me first explain why I've spent the last several years developing a new application framework for LabVIEW. So this story starts approximately 10 years ago when I started a new job as a control systems engineer for a physics laboratory at a university. It was my responsibility to create the control and data acquisition systems for several experimental setups, and I decided to use LabVIEW to do this. Up to this point, I was a self-taught LabVIEW developer, so I attended the LabVIEW Core 1, Core 2, and Core 3 courses to make sure that I was developing code with the best practices. And it was in the Core 3 course where I was introduced to the Qt Message Handler design pattern, which is one of the most commonly used building blocks of multi-process applications in LabVIEW, which in the Core 3 course is presented in the form of the LabVIEW Qt Message Handler template. So I left the Core 3 course feeling that I now had the knowledge required to develop the multi-process applications required for the university using the LabVIEW Cube Message Handler template. What I didn't know, however, is that there was no easy way to create a multi-process application out of several LabVIEW Cube Message Handler templates. An example of a multi-process application that is built with the LabVIEW Cube Message Handler template is the well-known LabVIEW Continuous Measurement and Logging Sample Project that comes with LabVIEW which is built out of three key message handlers, one for the user interface, one for the acquisition of data, and one for the logging of data. But to create an application like this, you need to manually create and integrate every key message handler together to build up the frame of an application. It takes a long time to develop applications this way, and I soon realized that I was spending more time developing and debugging the frame of my applications than I was spending time to develop the specific functionality of each key message handler. So the good thing about the LabVIEW key message handler template is that it is easy to learn and use, and it is taught in the core three course as part of the NI official training and certification program. But in its current form, it is not modular, it is not scalable, it's not extensible, and there exists no dedicated debugger to debug applications built out of several of these. So Using this template to develop large multi-process applications is a very time-consuming and inflexible process. And to create the frame of a quality application out of many of these 
requires much more knowledge and experience than what you will acquire in the Core 3 course. Which, of course, is why we have the NI training and certification path. So that we can train our developers over many years to learn how to properly architect the frames of their applications until they are ready to demonstrate that they can architect the frame of a multi-process application for the CLA exam. It's a long journey, especially from core three to CLA. And after taking the CLA exam myself, I realized that the main difference between what you learn in the, in the core three course and what you need to demonstrate in the CLA exam is one of scalability. You need to demonstrate that you can take a single process and scale it into the frame of a multi-process application. So I thought, why not create a framework that would handle the scalability issue for developers at the core three level? so that they can easily scale the concepts that they learn in the core three course. And for these reasons, I decided to uh, create a new framework. So the requirements of my framework became the following. Every queued, <coughs> it was vitally important that every queued message handler in my framework had the same look, feel, and style of the Levy queued message handler template, so that core three developers would feel comfortable developing with the framework. Each queued message handler should be modular and allow its content to be encapsulated. Modularity provides a way for each queued message handler to become a reusable entity. Each queued message handler should be easy to scale. This means that a common interface is required by each queued message handler so that you can easily plug them together, much like you can Lego blocks, to quickly build up the frame of a multi-process application. And this can be done by either statically linking queued message handlers together or by dynamically loading a queued message handler from another queued message handler on demand during runtime. The framework should have a dedicated debugger that can provide the developer with debug information that LabVIEW natively doesn't provide, and to add an extra layer of accessibility and transparency to your running applications. The framework should use a priority queue for the, commu for the communication channels between queued message handlers allowing developers to assign priorities to their messages. And the framework should be built with object-oriented LabVIEW, providing the power of inheritance to the framework's architecture. Inheritance means that the framework's common API can exist in a common parent class to all queued message handlers, minimizing the amount of duplicated code required in each queued message handler. And with inheritance and by allowing you to override VIs, it's easier to develop things like hardware abstraction layers using the framework. And finally, I wanted the framework to work on both Windows and NIRT systems. Currently, Workers runs on Windows, and the RT compatibility version will hopefully be ready sometime next year. And so these were the, re the fundamental requirements of the framework. So moving on, what is a worker? The framework is called Workers because a modular queued message handler in the framework is called a worker. A worker is a queued message handler encapsulated in a class, which inherits from worker.lv class, which is the parent class of all workers. Now, now for developers that have no object-oriented LabVIEW experience, I simply tell them that you can think of a worker simply as a library that has its own type. And that's all you need to know about the use of classes in workers if you have no object-oriented LabVIEW experience. Of course, if you do have object-oriented LabVIEW experience, then you can develop your applications using inheritance with the framework. And I'll discuss the advantages of this later on in the presentation. So what does a worker look like in LabVIEW? Here we have a project containing four workers, worker A, worker B, worker C, and worker D. Let's have a look at the contents of one of the workers. Uh, let's select worker D. What you see here are the fundamental parts of a worker. There is a main VI, which is where the worker's queued message handler exists, and an initialization data cluster that is used to pass data into the worker's queued message handler when the worker is initialized. And that's it. When you create a new worker, these are the only two elements that it is required to have. Now let's have a look at what a worker's queued message, queued message handler looks like in code. What you see here is a worker's queued message handler that exists in the block diagram of its main VI. A worker's queued message handler is designed to have the same look, 
feel, and style as the Levy Queued Message Handler template and contains only the most fundamental parts of a queued message handler, keeping the design minimal and easy to understand. At the top here, we have an event handling loop, which is optional, and below that, a message handling loop, which every worker is required to have. At the beginning of the message handling loop, we have a VI, which dequeues messages from the worker's message queue. Message data is then acted upon in the subsequent case structure, whose case is selected by a string. And finally, we have an error handler. And the blue data, uh, the blue wire that runs through the block diagram is the worker's main data wire, which is a cluster of data that is private to this worker, where you, where you can add your own data to be acted upon in the loops. A worker's message handling loop is required to have four cases for its proper functioning in the framework. Uh, two cases are required for initialization and two cases are required for the shutting down of the worker. And so these are the fundamental parts of a worker. And a worker's application would simply be built out of several queued message handlers that look like this. How do you build a frame of a multi um, of a multi-process application using workers? A common interface exists. Like, sorry, a common interface connects workers together, allowing you to plug a worker directly into another worker so that you can quickly build up the frame of a multi-process application. This makes both creating and scaling the frame of a worker's application very easy, and this is an automated process. The first way to plug a worker into another worker is by using the create add worker scripting tool. Using the create add worker, worker scripting tool, which is what you see here on the left, you can create a new worker and plug it into another worker as a statically linked subworker. And when used together with the worker hierarchy viewer tool, shown here on the right, you can watch your application's worker call chain hierarchy grow every time you create and add a new worker to your application using the tool. So say, for example, I wanted to create the frame of the continuous measurement and logging sample project, which consists of uh, a user interface queued message handler an acquisition queued message handler and a login queued message handler. Using workers, what I would do is I would first create a blank project, and then I'd use the create add worker tool to create the head worker of the application, which would be the UI worker in this case, and then use the tool twice more to create and add the acquisition and logging workers as statically linked sub workers to the UI worker, resulting in the worker call chain diagram that you see in the middle of the screen. I will demonstrate the use of these tools later on during the live demonstration. So what does the frame of an application that the tool creates for us look like in code? What you see here is the block diagram of the UI workers main VI corresponding to the worker call chain diagram uh, shown in the top right corner of the screen. You can see here the queued message handler of the UI worker and below it are the main VIs, so the queued message handlers of the acquisition and logging workers, which were created, added, and integrated by the tool. And what you see here is, is the functional frame of a worker's application. If I run the, uh, the head worker's main VI, then each of the three queued message handlers will be launched sequentially. And when I shut down the head worker's main VI, each queued message handler will also be shut down sequentially. So by using the create ed worker tool, Anyone can create the frame of a multi-process application by uh, using modular and scalable and LabVIEW queued message handler template style queued message handlers very easily and quickly without doing any coding at all. The second way to integrate a worker into a worker's call chain hierarchy is by loading a worker dynamically from another worker on demand using the framework's API. Using the dynamically load worker VI, which is available on the worker's palette, you can load a worker dynamically from another worker whenever you need to during runtime. This VI will load a worker and integrate it into the application as a sub worker of the worker that it is called from. To use this VI, you simply, as shown in the, uh, the example here, you wire to it the object constant of the worker that you want to dynamically load. 
as well as any initialization data that the worker requires when it is loaded. And that's all you have to do. The dynamically load worker, VI, will then perform the following tasks for you. It will launch the selected worker and create a message queue for it. It will register the worker as a sub worker with the worker that it is called from. It will initialize the worker and pass it any initialization data that you have set and integrate the worker into the worker's debugger. And when the application shuts down, the dynamically loaded worker will also be shut down as part of the application shutdown routine. So once you load a worker like this, there is nothing else you need to do in terms of application integration. So to summarize, number one, you can use the created worker scripting tool, or number two, the dynamically load worker VI to plug workers together to create the frame of a worker's application. How do you send messages between workers? <clears throat> the framework uses a priority queue to send messages between worker message handling loop cases. And messages are enqueued into the priority queues through use of the framework's messaging API. Firstly, the framework uses the same queue as that used by the Active Framework. So the performance and features of the queue are the same as that of the Active Framework. By, by using a priority queue, developers can assign priorities to their messages so that they can decide which messages should be processed ahead of other messages. The framework allows developers to assign one of three priorities to their messages, either low, normal, or high. And there is a fourth priority that is reserved by use of the framework, which is critical priority, which is used for the initializing and shutting down of workers in an application. And unlike standard LabVIEW FIFO queues and events, the priority queue always guarantees that messages are dequeued in the same order that they are enqueued for any given priority. So there are two types of messages that you can send within the framework. And the first type is an asynchronous standard message, which will send a message to any message handling loop case of any worker. To send a standard message, you need to use the NQ standard message VI which can be found on the worker's palette. So to send a standard message, two steps are required. The, the first step is to use the NQ standard message VI to send a standard message to the case of a worker that expects to receive a standard message. To do this, you need to wire to the NQ standard message VI the queue of the worker that you want to send a message to, and the case of the worker's message handling loop that will receive the message defined as a string. Optionally, you can also wire to it a payload, which can be any data type you like, since it is packed as a variant, and you can also select the priority of the message, so low, normal, or high. So step two then occurs in the, in the case of the worker that receives the standard message, where the data that it receives uh, will need to be converted to the correct data type. So you can send a standard message to any case of any worker's message handling loop, so long as you provide uh, the NQ standard message VI with the recipient worker's queue and case. The next type of message, the second type of message that you can send within the framework is a callback message. A callback message allows you to send a message from one worker to another and then receive a payload back from the recipient worker where the message flow looks similar to that in the diagram that you see here. To send a callback message, you use the NQ callback message VI, which is also available on the worker's palette. And there are two versions of it, an asynchronous and a synchronous version. Uh, so to send a callback message, three steps are required. The, the first step is to use the NQ callback message VI to send a callback message to the case of another worker that expects to receive a callback message. To do this, you need to wire to the NQ callback message VI the queue of the worker that you want to send a callback message to and the case of the worker's message handling loop that will receive the message defined as a string. Optionally, you can also send a payload along with the message. You can set the message priority and you can also set a timeout for this VI since this VI will wait until it receives a reply message back from the worker that it sent the callback message to. 
Step two then occurs in the case of the worker that receives the callback message. And in this case, you need to use the callback easy reply VI, which simply sends a reply message back to the worker that it received the callback message from. And the input to this VI is simply a variant containing the payload to be returned. And so step three then occurs in the worker that sent the original callback message where the NQ callback message VI will return the reply data that it received from the callback easy reply VI on the previous slide. So that's a brief overview of how to send both standard messages and callback messages between worker message handling loop cases using the framework's messaging API. How do you debug a worker's application? You do this by using the worker's debugger, which is a dedicated debugger designed to make a worker's application more transparent and more accessible during runtime. What you see here is the task manager tab of the worker's debugger. The debugger's task manager shows you a tree list of all the running workers, uh, of all the running workers in a worker's application, along with the worker's clone ID. Since every worker's main VI is a shared clone, as well as the status of the worker. A worker can have a number of different statuses, which are assigned to it by the framework to provide feedback during the initialization and shutdown routines of a worker's application. There is also a right-click menu for the, for the task manager tab. And the option I wanna highlight here is the option called Open Running VI, which will jump you directly to the running clone of a worker's cube message handler, where you can then access its running front panel and block diagram for further debugging using the standard LiveView debugging tools. I'll demonstrate this later on in the live demonstration. Uh, so in summary, the debugger's task manager shows you what's running and allows you to access the code of your running queued message handlers. The next tab of the worker's debugger is the message log tab. And its purpose is to provide you with something that LiveView natively doesn't provide you with. And that is the flow of messages at runtime throughout your multi-process application. The message log shows you a timestamp list of all the messages that are sent in a worker's application, showing you where, in other words, which case of which worker a message was enqueued from, to which case of which worker a message was dequeued into. It also shows you when and where any errors have occurred in your application. And it also allows you to apply string, string filtering on any column so that you can, for example, see only messages sent from say worker A to worker B or so that you can filter out only the errors that have occurred in an application. <clears throat> it also allows you to add string. Um, <clears throat> there is also a right-click menu for the, uh, for the message log tab. And the right-click option I want to mention here is the go to case option. This option allows you to jump directly to the case of a worker where an error has occurred. So for example, if we right click over the error in the highlighted row here and selected go to case, we will jump directly to the case of the worker where the error has occurred, which in this case would be worker A's get counter value case without needing to search for where the error has occurred manually, saving you time when you're debugging your applications. So in summary, the message log makes your running code more transparent by showing you the flow of messages and errors that occur in your application during runtime. And the right-click menu allows you to jump directly to parts of your code where errors have occurred. So that's an overview of the worker's debugger, and it really plays a vital role in developing applications efficiently with the framework. While a Worker's queue message handler has the same look and style as the Levy queue message handler template. Because a worker is a class, the class provides you with modularity with inheritance. Now, as mentioned before, uh, developers can comfortably develop with the framework without knowing anything about object-oriented LiveView, since Workers was created for those at the core three level, at the LiveView core three level. These developers only need to understand that a worker's class is much like a library with its own data type. But for those of you that do have object-oriented LiveView knowledge and experience, let me explain how you can use inheritance to your advantage when developing applications with the framework. What you see here are three workers. Every worker is a class which inherits from worker.lv class, which is where the framework's common API exists. 
Now, say you wanted to add your own common code and features to every worker. Instead of adding duplicated code to every worker, you can inherit your workers from a custom base class. And in this base class, you can put your common code, such as common VIs, common data, and even common message handling loop cases, which can then be used by every worker that inherits from it, reducing the amount of duplicated code required in every worker and resulting in overall less code in your projects. You can also override the worker's API. For example, you could override the framework's common error handler, which exists on the block diagram of every worker's main VI, so that you can provide your applications with your own custom and common error handling. You can also use inheritance to create hardware abstraction layers, whereby your hardware abstraction layer's common interface will exist in an abstract base class, and your specific implementations will exist in every worker that inherits from that class. So these are just some of the ways that you can use inheritance to help develop better applications with the framework. And it really is up to every developer and what level of LabVIEW experience they have, whether or not they choose to develop with the object-oriented possibilities of the framework or not. So that's an overview of the main features of the framework. I want to quickly present the main new feature in the latest version of Workers 3.1 which was uh, released uh, a few months ago. So the latest tool in the Workers Toolkit is the Workers Library, which over time will evolve into a library of pre-built workers that can be used on demand in your applications. This is the current window of the Workers Library. And at the moment, it only contains one worker, which is a message pump. The message pump is a pre-built worker that comes with the framework. And by using this tool, you can add a copy of the message pump directly into your projects. And because a worker has a common interface that allows you to plug one worker directly into another worker, you can dynamically plug the message pump into your applications and use it immediately. In the future, I plan to add more workers to the workers library, and I also plan to add third-party support to the library so that other developers can contribute their own pre-built workers to the library to be used by others in the community. So <clears throat> now we get to the live demonstration part of the presentation. Um, just a minute, I'm going to have a look. I'll probably answer the questions uh, later on, guys, after the, after the presentation. Um, so I'll get back to those. So for now, um, yeah, we have the live demonstration part of the presentation. Here I'm going to create the frame of a small workers application, starting from a blank project and using the Create Ed Worker Scripting tool to build up the application's frame. And finally, I'm going to add a message pump from the workers library to the application so that you can see how everything integrates together. So <clears throat> the first thing you need to do is uh, to open LabVIEW. Uh, and once you have installed workers into LabVIEW via the uh, VI package manager, uh, you need to create a blank project, which I'll do now. And we need to save the blank project. This will do. OK, we're ready. So once our workers is installed, in the Project Explorer, go to Tools and select Workers Tools. And what you see here is the Workers Tools menu. These are all the tools in the Workers Toolkit. And I think I've been over all of them, yep, in the presentation so far. And throughout the uh, the live demo, I'll also go through each of these. So we have the uh, Create Head Worker tool, the Workers Debugger, the Worker Hierarchy Viewer tool, and the, uh, the new edition, the Workers Library. So to start off with, uh, select the Create Head Worker tool. OK. So. Uh, so uh, let's create the frame of the continuous measurement and logging sample project that everyone is familiar with, consisting of three queued message handlers, a user interface queued message handler, uh, a logging queued message handler, and an acquisition queued message handler. Which, uh, so to do this, um, the first queued message handler, or the first worker that we're going to create is the UI worker. So using this tool, the first field here allows us to sl select the type of worker that we want to create. So we can select a worker with an event handling loop, which is great for, for user interfaces since uh, 
event uh, handler can capture the events from the front, uh, for, for, can capture the front panel events. On the user interface, uh, we can select a worker without an event handling loop, which means it only has a message handling loop, or you can create a worker from your own customized templates. For the UI worker, we're gonna select worker with event handling loop. The next field allows us to give our worker a name, call it UI. The next field allows us to select a class to inherit our worker from. Um, by default, every worker inherits from worker.lv class, so we're gonna leave that as is. We're not gonna worry about an alias, but we will give the icon a header. And that's it, and press OK. Now, the first worker that you add to a project will require, which is gonna be the head worker of an application, supposedly, um, requires a launcher to run it. And that's what this little dialog box here asks you to do. It says, to run your new worker, you will need to use a launcher VI. Would you like to create a launcher VI for your new worker? So I'm gonna say, okay. And the operation has completed successfully. So if we look at what's in our project now, we can see we have our launcher VI and we have one worker. If we look at the contents of the worker, we can see that it contains the two elements that I uh, mentioned before, the main VI, which is where the, queued, the worker's queued message handler exists, and an initialization data cluster that can be used to pass data into the queued message handler when the worker is initialized. Let's have a look at the block diagram of the main VI. And you can see this is um, <clears throat> a queued message handler uh, with an event handling loop and a message handling loop. And if we have a look at what cases, what default cases the message handling loop has, it has the four required framework cases, and that's it. So this is actually a little application. If you run the launcher VI, it will launch, it will run this queued message handler. But we want to uh, we want to scale this queued message handler. We want to add a logging and an acquisition queued message handler to this queued message handler. So let's continue and do that. So then the next queued message handler, oh, wait a second. First of all, I'm gonna open up the worker hierarchy viewer tool. So at the bottom of the tool, you can see uh, this little button here, WHV. If I click it, it will open up the worker hierarchy viewer tool. And if I select the UI worker and say view tree, you can see that there's only one worker in the application at the moment. So let's use the create ed worker tool to create uh, the acquisition worker. So for this, I'm gonna select a worker without an event handling loop because we don't need it. Um, we're gonna give it a name. Inheritance is the same, change the icon header. And at the bottom here, we have the option, this flag, to add the acquisition worker as a sub worker to another worker. So we wanna add the acquisition worker, we wanna plug it in to the UI worker. So select UI, press okay. Tool's gonna to create, yep, it's in the project now. And the operation has completed successfully. So I'm gonna save everything. <clears throat> and I'm gonna refresh the, the, uh, the worker hierarchy viewer tree. And we can see now that we have the acquisition plugged in to the UI worker. Let's do this one more time for the logging worker. We wanna add the logging worker as a sub worker to the UI worker. Okay. Uh, refresh the tree and we can see now that we have created the frame of the continuous measurement and logging sample project consisting of three key message handlers. The UI key message handler is the head one, is the head key message handler of the application and it contains two sub queued message handlers, two sub workers. So if we look at what the, uh, if we look at the code that the tool created for us, looks like, uh, I'm gonna go to the, uh, the UI workers main VI. And we should see, yep, we can see here uh, the acquisition, workers queued message handler, and the logging workers queued message handler have been added and integrated, plugged in to the UI queued message handler. So just to show you what they look like, I'm gonna double click on the uh, this VI here. And you can see that this is the queued message handler 
just the message handling loop of the acquisition worker and the logging workers queue message handler is also just a message handling loop. So very quickly, we've created and scaled uh, the frame of our application. And of course, we can continue adding as many queue message handlers to our application as we like. Now I'm going to uh, run the application uh, and jump into it through the debugger. So I'm going to open up the workers debugger. It's very important that the workers debugger is running before you run uh, your application so that the application can connect to the debugger. So when I launch the application with the launcher VI, what should happen is that the, the first column, well, actually all the columns of the task manager should be populated with what's running. So I'm going to do that now, I'm going to run the application. Yep, and we can see now that the, uh, the debugger's task manager now contains three workers. This is the, uh, the UI worker is the head worker of the application. And this is a tree list. So attached to it are the acquisition and login workers. You can see their clone IDs since every worker's main VI is a shared clone and their status is initialized, is initialized which is correct. I'm gonna jump in now to the UI workers running clone by right clicking on the, uh, the highlighted row here and selecting open running VI. And we can see here that this is the this is the running clone. If you look at the title bar, you can see that this is um, the running instance of our UI worker. Uh, and here we can add breakpoints, add a, you know highlight execution, etc. So the application is running. If I hard stop the application, then you'll see the status in the status column has now changed to aborted. You see the last uh, case, the last status that it was in and you'll see aborted if uh, it was uh, if it was if there was yeah aborted with the abort button so good okay next step next step next let's add a message pump into the application and get that running as well using the workers library so i'm going to select workers library i'm going to select message pump and add worker to project so this is going to this tool is going to add a copy of the message pump, which is a dynamically loadable worker into our project. So that's successful. So now we have four workers in our project, and the message pump is a dynamically loadable worker, which you can uh, basically use immediately in your applications. So the acquisition worker, the acquisition worker. Now, if this was a real application and we were actually acquiring data from real world hardware, then the acquisition worker would be the worker that's, uh, that's performing this task. So let's add a case at the end of the, uh, the cases that we have called read data. Read data. So hypothetically, in this case, we would be polling data from some, some real world instrument say, you know, five times per second, 10 times per second, something like that. But this case needs to be called by, by something in our application uh, at, at this uh, periodic interval. So this is what we're going to use the message pump for. We're going to load the message pump dynamically and get it to send a message to the read data case of the acquisition worker, let's say 10 times per second. So let's do this. So when the uh, acquisition worker is initialized, I want it to load the message pump worker. So the message pump has a public API and I'm gonna drop in the create and start VI from the message pumps API. I'm gonna wire it up and I'm also gonna show you the code behind it in a minute so that you can understand what's going on behind the scenes. So behind the scenes of the create and start uh, VI in the message pump, we have two VIs. The first one is called create pump. Uh, if we have a look at its code, you can see that uh, it's using the dynamically load worker VI to create an instance of the message pump at runtime and plug it into the acquisition worker as a sub worker. So that's what's going on behind the scenes of, uh, of the VI that I just dropped on uh, into the initialized case of the acquisition worker. So the inputs to this VI, the first input is a case that we want 
to send the message to periodically, which is the read data case of this worker. The next uh, field is the create, you know, we, is we need to set a um, time period. So we're going to send a message once every 100 milliseconds, so 10 times per second. And we need to give our message pump a name. So what message pump? So, and so what's going to happen now is the acquisition work is going to be initialized. It's going to create an instance of the message pump worker. And uh, it's going to send a message to the read data case at 10 times per second. So to actually see that this case is running, I'm going to add some code in here. Let's uh, create an indicator. Uh, there's its front panel element. So. All right. So now I'm going to run the application uh, and jump into the acquisition worker through the debugger to see if the read data case of the acquisition worker is incrementing at 10 times per second. So again, open the debugger first, run the application. And we can see now in the task manager that the message pump is now a dynamically loaded worker and it's dynamically loaded from the acquisition worker. I'm going to right click on the acquisition worker and see open running VI. And we can see now that, yep, the running clone of the acquisition worker, the numeric uh, indicator is updating at 10 times per second. So that's, that's, yeah, that, that's basically how you create applications with uh, with workers. Um, it's very it's very modular. It's built in the style of the Levy Q message handler template. It's intuitive to 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 learn, um, and it's very scalable. So I'm going to stop the application now and jump back into the presentation. <clears throat> So to end, I want to summarize how the framework benefits developers at different levels. So for developers at the core three level, workers provides them with a familiar and scalable solution to what they learn in the core three course. The available scripting tools are easy to use uh, to create and visualize the frame of a multi-process application. And there are a few quick drop shortcuts available designed to help streamline your workflow. And again, object-oriented LabVIEW uh, is not a requirement to comfortably use the framework by uh, developers at this level. Object-oriented LabVIEW experience, sorry. That being said, if you do have object-oriented LabVIEW experience, then you can develop your applications using inheritance by inheriting your workers from your own custom-based classes, where you can add common code that can be used by all your workers create hardware abstraction layers, et cetera. Development using workers uh, for all levels is modular, scalable, and extensible. And the workers debugger provides you with uh, accessible and transparent debugging for the whole application, helping you quickly find and access bugs in your code. For teams of developers, <clears throat> uh, because workers are easy to decouple from one another, this allows individual workers to be both developed and tested separately uh, by parts of a team from the main body of an application and then easily integrated into the main body of the application, uh, the, the body of the main application when ready. The common interface that exists between workers allows developers to create their own reusable libraries of pre built workers available to be plugged into their, their applications on demand when needed. And because workers is designed for those at the core three level and above, this low level entry point means that it is easier to integrate new developers into your teams without requiring them to have a higher level of LabVIEW experience. To help you get up and running with workers, uh, there are three sample projects uh, that come with the, uh, the framework that have their own documentation. And there is also an official user guide for the framework. And I also have several tutorial videos available on the workers uh, YouTube channel that show you how to use the various scripting tools 
the main API VIs and the best practices for developing applications with the framework. And the latest version of Workers is always available through both the NI Tools Network and the VI Package Manager. So to end, <clears throat> Workers is a Qt Message Handler-based application framework for LabVIEW that is easy to learn for anyone at the Core 3 level and above. The framework has been designed to have a clean and minimal look and feel. It allows you to develop in the style of the LabVIEW Qt Message Handler template whilst being flexible and supporting an object-oriented architecture at the same time. Uh, and, you can use the, and you can use workers to develop applications ranging from a single Qt message handler to applications consisting of hundreds of Qt message handlers. And I really hope that this framework can help developers at all levels to develop multi-process applications in LabVIEW in a simpler and more efficient way now and into the future. And that's it. Thank you guys for uh, <clears throat> for joining. I hope you found it interesting. Let's have a look at some of the questions. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Bill. Um, so licensing. So I mean, it's there. There is no license. Some I, I don't really know anything about licensing. Um, you can use this for commercial purposes. That's not a problem. It's uh, the code is the code is unlocked, so you can see all the code. I don't know what the def definition of open source actually is. I mean, the source code is open, so if that's the definition, then yeah, I guess it's open source. But you can use it. Um, you, you don't need a license to use it commercially. You can use it for home for hobby projects, for educational purpose, purposes at universities. Uh, I know companies that use it for their commercial products. So, um, and all the code is open and accessible. Uh, the framework code is open and accessible. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> What else do we have here? Uh, the message pump is is um, yeah it's 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 an it's an event generated timer. So it uses the timeout of an event handling loop to 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 pump messages. Thanks, Chris. Uh, what else have I missed? Anything else here? Sell me. I it's up. To, it's up to you whether it's worth using over DQMH. I mean, I haven't used DQMH, so I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Uh, yeah, Zach also, yeah. Um, it's same with the licensing. It's um, you don't need a license to use it for commercial purposes. It's all open. What do I use to display the worker hierarchy diagrams? Uh, they're created manually. <laughs> I iterate through uh, through the applications and create them manually. Uh, so order, uh, so subordinate. So sub workers, do they always start when the supervisor starts? Um, so the supervisor. So it's 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 a uh, it's kind of a cascade effect. So the first worker starts first. And then its sub workers will start, and then their sub workers will start. So it goes from top to bottom, but then it also sends a confirmation that it has been initialized successfully. So it goes from top to bottom, and then it goes from bottom to top. And it's the same for the uh, initialization of the application, and same for the shutting down uh, sequence of an application. And the if the supervisor dies, does this? I guess the sub worker does it die also? If the if the supervisor dies, yes, yeah, sub workers will will die. Correct, Zach. Um, I yeah, I had a look at different licensing like MIT, BSD, and usually it's like many, 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 many pages of technical details. And I am not a. I have. I really don't know what they're talking about. So I don't really know the, the difference between the licenses. Um, I guess I need to at some point, but at the moment it's uh, it's all it's all free, and you can use it as you like. Um, do I know what problems? Uh, just a minute, uh, t Tim. What versions? Uh, 2015 onwards is supported. Uh, a lot of people ask me if it works on uh, uh, NIRT systems. Not yet. 
The plan is uh, that the RT compatibility version will be released next year. Um, that, that's under development at the moment. Uh, but 2015 onwards is, is supported, correct? How workers that do not die in a clean manner handled? Uh, do not, I guess you mean do not shut down. I mean, so no, workers are not uh, loaded with uh, a call and forget asynchronous call. Um, they call and collect. So they're always tethered to one another. So if you stop, if you, if you, if you, hard stop any worker it's good. they're all going to stop because they're all tethered together can the worker work can the worker debugger work on the real time and can data be sent to the host while running yeah again um next year that's the plan for next year for next year the worker debugger should be able to work it'll be a remote debugger so you'll be able to use it on uh, embedded systems when workers are running on embedded systems <laughs> Roger, is it, yeah, it is possible to build the workers as a separate PPLs, yes. But again, if you build if you build PPLs and you're using classes, then the inheritance hierarchy will be different in the PPLs than it will be in the development environment. So you won't be able to send messages directly from a PPL to a non-PPL uh, version of uh, of workers because you're going to be sending a class with a different with a different name from a different inheritance hierarchy so it is it is absolutely um and i, I i've done this and i know other people that do this um i guess it's similar you have to approach it in the same way that you that you approach building ppls with the active framework because it also it's a object-oriented um based framework so yes the answer is yes, but you have to know what you're doing. Okay, if there's no more questions, then thank you very much. And um, I'm always available. Um, there's five videos on the uh, official workers, five tutorial videos on the official workers website um, and also on the YouTube channel. And I also have a booth in the, uh, the booth section of the GLA Summit where you can definitely ask me any questions and I'll answer it then. Jim, um, interesting. The code was using call and collect and calling the asynchronous CPR, but not calling the wait on the secret. Okay. Um, all right. I'll have to look into that. I'll have to, uh, I haven't noticed that myself, but uh, that's interesting. I'll have to look at, into that. Yeah. The reason I use call and collect is because I don't want to have phantom workers running in memory somewhere. Um, and that allows me to tether everything together so that if one worker, you know, if you, if you hard stop one worker, then the whole application just stops. But I'll look into memory leaks. Be extremely careful to make sure that the wait on async call is made. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's built into 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 the framework. The uh, the wait on async call, so that you can return any errors that occur in a worker to its parent worker uh, when it's shutting down. Hard stop. Yeah, I, yes, correct. That's what I'm referring to. Um, if, if you uh, press the abort button on the main, uh, on yeah, on the front panel of a VI or, or even a block diagram, I guess. But yes. I don't know if it requires you to use wait on collect. I'm not sure um, because that's in a completely separate part of the code. Levy wouldn't know if that code is ex going to be executed later on. But maybe for closing references, it's I guess it's required. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Have you found a way around it, Jim? Or Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think my time is up, guys. So thanks all for coming. I hope you found it interesting. <clears throat> and uh, if you have any questions, uh, please send them to me.
Thank you very much, Jim. Yep. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, guys.